I, I write narrative nonfiction with a historical component. I tend to try to look at things from the roots. The last book, it was the roots of New York, how New York and how, in some ways, American society became what it did. My fourth book is called Descartes' Bones. It's about the bones of a philosopher. Really, though, this, to me, is a way to try to understand the development of the modern world. The reason we're in Amsterdam talking about a uh, French philosopher is that Descartes spent most of his career in the Netherlands. He came here because it was, in the 17th century, the most tolerant place in Europe. It would be reasonable not to think that the book about the bones of a 17th century French philosopher is a love story. I would argue that, in, in a way, it is. His own philosophy was changed by a daughter who was born illegitimately. The, this daughter was the real love of his life. She died when she was five years old. And that whole period, from the, her conception to her death, is also the period of the maturing of his philosophy. A lot of his contemporaries were doing what we would call science, but there was a lot of uneasiness because whether they were looking under a microscope or looking through a telescope or dissecting corpses, there was no foundation for what they were doing. And Descartes, above uh, anyone else, was unsettled by this. He decided that all the training that he had had was built on swampy foundations. So he systematically took elements of his own education, uh, tested them, he kept doubting. He decided he would keep doubting until he came to something that was undoubtable. So he doubted all of uh, Christian teaching because you couldn't test it. Uh, you might think the, that the evidence of your senses was uh, incontrovertible, but in fact, he said, how do I know that this tree is really standing there? Your senses might be deceiving you. You might be dreaming. He finally hit bedrock when he came to the notion that he could not deny the fact that he was thinking those thoughts at that moment. I think, therefore I am. The fact that he was thinking meant something existed. That which was thinking must exist. And that then became the ground on which he would build modern philosophy, his own philosophy, and really the whole philosophy of modernity. He was creating a way of understanding the world that didn't need faith. If you are doing scientific explorations, there's no point at which you need belief in God or in the Christian teachings to support that. And essentially, ever since then, there's been this tension in the Western world between faith and reason. Ultimately, it became, to me, a story not just about the exotic fact that a philosopher had his bones uh, spread around, but that what these bones represented. They, were, they became symbols for other people of what he was seen as starting. It's much the same way that the Catholics treated the bones of saints as relics. They took his bones to be relics of modernity. The followers of Descartes, the Cartesians, held a series of banquets all around Paris over these bones. They were trying to win legitimacy for, for scientific inquiry. And the idea was to use the bones to win support for their cause. With great ceremony, they had them buried in the same church that uh, Genevieve, who was the patron saint of Paris, uh, where she was buried. Most of his bones follow a certain path. The skull, however, was taken when the body was uh, disinterred, and it follows its own trajectory across Europe and through the modern centuries. Finally, the skull makes its way to the French Academy of Sciences in Paris. From there, it becomes part of a number of other uh, developments in the history of science. One is the idea that the size of a brain, and therefore the size of a skull and its capacity, uh, reflects intelligence. In this debate about skull size, suddenly the people who are opposed to the idea that skull size matters find the skull of Descartes and they bring it forth. Descartes was, after all, the archetypal French genius. Descartes had a very small skull, which completely flew in the face of the theory that skull size matters. When you're writing a book like this, you're writing history, but you're also ultimately doing a detective story. And for my own purpose, as well as for the narrative of the book, I had to try to figure out where are the bones. Descartes' skull now is in the Musée de l'Homme, the, the Museum of Man in uh, Paris. Uh, Descartes, the rest of Descartes' bones, uh, you will have to read the book to find out.